Hi, everybody. Welcome to the end of the first weekend of Culturama in November. And we're going to end this weekend with a fabulous, fabulous keynote uh, address uh, from Stephanie Hammer and Romaine Washington, uh, both of whom I admire greatly. Um, Stephanie is a, um, a retired uh, professor from UCR in comparative literature who became a, uh, who, who went off to pursue full-time writing. And her writing is just fantastic. I mean, it's magical realist uh, stuff that uh, it, it, she says she slips into kind of without realizing she's doing magical realism, uh, which is, I, I think, just wonderful. And Romaine is a uh, high school teacher in our area in, in um, not Rancho Cucamonga at Los Osos High. And I just ran into her, her poetry maybe five years ago and it's it's just floors me it's most wonderful and but they, they are my my bamboo dart siblings and i'm so thrilled to be part with them in bamboo dart and to be part of bamboo dart it's just great so i'm just going to turn over the floor to them and when when they are finished we will uh you'll have a chance to ask whatever questions you like so why don't we start with with stephanie okay thanks so much john um, it's great to see all of you here, Romaine. It's so wonderful to be reading with you. Yay. I'm so excited to hear to hear you. And thanks very much, you guys, for spending some of your Saturday evening with us. Um, I want to do a acknowledgement um, to the amazing Coast Salish people who are the um, who are the stewards of the tribal lands that I'm sitting I'm sitting on and gosh do we uh, folks need to do a better job of helping those stewards because we live in a beautiful place and we need to take better care of it. Um, that said, I am going to read a poem and I'm going to read a couple of pieces of fiction. So here we go. Um, first of all, I want to do a shout out to wonderful Francesca Terzano who puts out literary alchemy. I was lucky enough to appear, at, uh, to appear in this wonderful Wonder Woman covered issue. Um, and I'm gonna read a poem called, Have You Seen? Have you seen my dog? A white guy pulls up in a truck. The poet adjusts her straw hat. Is he some horny senior citizen trying to pick her up like the bearded man last summer? who drove next to her for 10 minutes while she was walking, telling her about life on the island and how crazy his first wife was. He was so broken down old that it took her almost nine minutes to realize that this was indeed a pickup situation. So this time she's ready, but no. This man is looking for his golden haired retriever. She's really friendly, he keeps on saying. Then, I live over there at that place with the fence. Poet says, I'm your neighbor. She points in the direction of her house. No reaction. What's your name, she says, Gary. He doesn't ask who she is. My dog, he says, my dog. I'll keep an eye out, poet says, wondering how she'll ever reach him if she sees the dog because he hasn't said his address or given her any information other than that he has a fence, but then so do several people. She watches to see what driveway he pulls into. She walks to the end of the road and turns around. Then she sees a different, slightly younger white man in shorts standing by his mailbox. Did you lose a dog, he says. She says, no, but Gary did. Who's he, says Shorts. He's your next door neighbor, says Poet. Well, tell him I have his dog. Poet walks back, sees Gary in his truck, flags him down. That guy has your dog, she informs him. L Gary guns the engine. Suddenly, a white woman with a shiny silver necklace runs out of Gary's driveway. Have you seen our dog? No, says the poet for the third time, but your neighbor has. Necklace looks blank and then says, he's so upset, meaning the poet thinks Gary. Poet walks home, pours a glass of wine, remembers her big city East Coast mother, 
observing in an overcrowded subway car packed with silent, sweaty strangers. You know, she said, people can be really weird. So that's Gary. <laughs> And you can read about him and, and uh, uh, other assorted characters in this, uh, in this issue. And um, now for something completely different. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from my novelette, Rescue Plan. And Rescue Plan just came out this year. I'm so excited about it. And it is indeed part of the amazing, amazing Bamboo Dart series. And here's Romaine's chapbook that's beautiful. And you're going to be hearing from it. And here's John's. And there are tons of other people. So many. Dennis Kalachi, who is here. Meg Pokras, who is not here because she's in England. Tim Hatch, who is coming up very soon. Uh, Juanita Mance, amazing. <laughs> Romaine or I are totally great minds are thinking alike here. Anyway, these are such amazing, beautifully designed little books, and they're all different. Um, some of them are poems, some of them are short stories, and mine is a novelette, aka a really long short story. So I'm going to read a little bit from a part of the story that I don't always read from. And this is in honor of uh, Linda Hogan's wonderful uh, class earlier today. So this is Gomer, who is the hero. He's 15, he's biracial, he sees spirits, and he has another secret that he's trying to navigate. He's in the locker room at the high school of the swim gym, and he is, has just fainted. Then the locker room revolved around Gomer and he felt himself falling. Someone caught him just before he hit his head on the cement floor. Hey dude, are you okay? It was the handsome guy, Christopher. He had his arms around him. You were standing there staring into space, muttering, and then you started to sway, Christopher said. Christopher stood him back up and Gomer pulled away and walked over to his locker. He could feel himself turning red. I just felt dizzy for a second, said Gomer. It's probably your blood sugar, said Christopher, sitting on the bench. Swimming really drains you, so you have to eat a clean diet. Yeah, Gomer took a breath and looked at Christopher. The older boy smiled, chill as ever. You know, said Gomer, I do feel kind of hungry. Let's get something to eat, Christopher said. They put their clothes on. Gomer tried not to look at Christopher and failed, while the older boy talked about swimming and nutrition. They walked out of the swim gym and Christopher pointed out his moped. This isn't a motorcycle, said Christopher, but we can get around faster than walking, that's for sure. Gomer got on behind him. The roads of narrow interior were bumpy, but Christopher took the bumps and turns easily and Gomer swayed with him. It felt to Gomer like he was holding onto a live wire of sinews and energy. No, it was more solid than that, warmer. Shoulder blades jutting into him as they took the turns together back muscles flexing against him, and inside it all, a heart that was beating on the same side as his, ahead of his, powering them both forward. They hit downtown in a matter of minutes and cruised along Main Street, swerving in and out of the tight spaces between cars. As Christopher maneuvered, Gomer could feel himself easing into the ride, and he a Weevil Organic Cafe and Pizza Shop. Find your favorite author here, read a dented yellow sign above the door. So that's just a little snippet um, from Rescue Plan. I hope you'll check it out along with the other amazing selections in the, in the Bamboo Dart Collective. 
um, re there's really great stuff there. So take a look at the storefront. So I am going to close by doing something that I never do. And that is that I'm going to read something that I wrote last week. Um, as I said, I don't usually do this, but since this is a learning community, I think it's really interesting and cool to share work that's kind of in progress. You're going to notice some real rough edges. This is, again, this is a first draft and first drafts are first drafts. But I want to share it because it's a testament to why it's great to hang out with other writers. Because this piece is absolutely influenced by a project of John Brantingham's. John is writing about this really weird guy whose name is Finnegan. And Finnegan is uses some of the biographical material that belongs to John himself, but it's such an extreme character. It's pushed so way out that it's not John at all anymore. It's somebody else. Well, I love that as a technique. It's such an interesting idea. So I have created a character like that. So this is Scarsdale Worthington Cohen. And the title of my piece is Scarsdale Moves to Cutting and Goes to the Dry Cleaner. And here we go. Scarsdale Worthington Cohen had always thought it would be breathtaking to live in the country until she actually moved to the village of Cutting. Her friends tried to warn her, but they were respectful. And when you are respectful, you are indirect. And when you are indirect, people may not understand the point you are making. Why so respectful? Well, Scarsdale had had a superior education, having gone to Miss Skylark School for Girls in Manhattan. And she went to a private college and then to the University of Antwerp. And then because she was fairly insecure about how smart she was, she got one PhD and then another PhD and then a different master's degree and several community college certificates. That's why her friends didn't just say to her, Scarsdale, you are crazy to leave Los Angeles and move so far north. You are going to be sorry not to have a Bloomingdale's and a Whole Foods and some select boutiques and several universities, both public and private and a whole giant library nearby. The author Thomas Pinchon lived in Trinidad, California and I'll be near his spirit, Scarsdale informed her friends. And they nodded politely not having the heart to tell her that Thomas Pinchon had only lived in the remote beach town for a year before beating it out of there and going back to a big city, although his exact whereabouts remain inconclusive. Filled with pastoral ideas about the country that she'd read in Thoreau and Goethe, Scarsdale enthusiastically embraced the move to Cutting, which is a tiny town on Peabody Island a little known protectorate off the coast of Del Norte, California, the county at the tippy top of the state. Scarsdale hus Scarsdale's husband, who hated all cities, after an exhausting legal practice defending experimental plastic surgeons, also enthusiastically drove the SUV crammed with books and high-heeled boots up the coast. New people, thought Scarsdale, what an adventure. After all, she'd lived in Belgium and Massachusetts where people can be quite puritanical and unfriendly. And she lived in New York where people can be extremely aggressive. So she thought she could get along anywhere. Her clue that there was a problem was the dry cleaner. As you know, the dry cleaning situation in any given locale is the measure of its degree of civilization. 
Unfortunately, there was no dry cleaner in cutting. In fact, there were no laundry services of any kind in cutting, not even a thing called a laundromat, which you've perhaps heard of, and which can be quite a picturesque establishment where you can meet strangers and talk about detergent and the government, which are more related to each other than you might think. This meant that Scarsdale had to go all the way to the next town over on Peabody Island, Elmsville, which interestingly had no elm trees at all because the Dutch mafia who ran the town had cut them all down and sold the lumber for housing developments near the Safeway. Scarsdale walked into Holland Cleaners with her dirty Kate Spade sweater and greeted a tall, somber man standing stiffly behind the counter. Hello there, how are you? She said brightly. She felt it was important to be friendly out in the country because that's what she thought about when she thought about rural living. She thought of the Amish in classic films like Witness and how supportive they all were and so attractive despite those outfits. And she thought of Palm Springs and how nice Sean Combs was that one time she fell down, the, uh, fell down on the sidewalk outside that bistro when she kind of overdone the happy hour. He picked her up and asked her if she was okay. So talented and really even more handsome in person. But the Holland dry cleaner did not answer. He glared at her with brilliant blue eyes, took the sweater and threw it in a blue sack. Phone number, he said. His voice was gravelly. She pronounced the digits of her cell phone. At the sound of the numbers, the dry cleaner lurched forward. He seemed to grow taller very quickly. He kept on rising one, then two, then three feet as the gravelly voice growled, is that a Southern California number? Scarsdale shrank back as the Holland dry cleaner loomed over her. Beverly Hills, she said timidly. There was a moment of silence. Even the machines and the dry cleaning establishment paused at the uttering of those two terrible words. Then the dry cleaner grew another foot as he bared his front teeth. These jutted out and suddenly extended down past his chin. Monday, he snarled. Carsdale paused to collect her wits. She had dealt with ogres, long story, as well as one particularly troublesome golem, shorter story, but a dry cleaner morphing into a werewolf on a cloudy afternoon without even the hint of a moon was something new to her, and she wasn't sure what to do. Still, she needed that Kate Spade sweater for a housewarming party she had invited her neighbors to in a few days. She only had two neighbors. One of them was a 100-year-old man who lived in a log cabin, and the other was a mysterious but beautiful weaver who lived in a lighthouse. They both seemed nice, and she really wanted to look her best for her party of four people. So Scarsdale raised her silver bracelet to her forehead. She screwed up her ex-New Yorker courage and taking a deep cleansing breath, she leaned over the counter and forced herself to look into the feral eyes of the terrifying dry cleaning creature. What's with the long wait on the dry cleaning, she said to him. We have to send it all off island, howled the dry cleaner who leapt onto the counter. Scarsdale shrieked in terror grabbed the crumpled ticket that was lying on the Formica countertop and ran out of the establishment. So how'd it go, said the husband, who was sitting in the driver's seat. Scarsdale sat down next to him. Monday, she said. Why so long, said her husband, who also was originally from New York. She didn't answer him. Instead, she had another question. Do you know 
Does the gun club up the road carry silver bullets? Thank you. All right, thank you, Stephanie. That's wonderful, um, and uh, I'm honored that you that I'm inspired them. Um, uh, up next is Romaine Washington. All right, thank you so much. What a joy! And here's more Bamboo Dart Press books. <laughs> and Kendall Johnson actually is the first poet in the Choya Needles collection, which I'm in and I'll be reading from. But we also have Gail. <laughs> so she has her book, Every Bend, and Peter Church's. And let's see, I have them all just about. <laughs> and Joel, uh, False Memories of a Cape Cod Clam Shack. Mm, might even go with that. And Cindy Rennie. I think Cindy Rennie's in almost everything, everywhere. So please visit Bamboo Dart Press. Um, wonderful selection. And it continues. Oh, and Nakia Cheney's book I have here somewhere. Um, here it is. I just bought this one. So, but I've read it. So um, yeah, just a wonderful selection. I am going to read from Choya Needles and it was edited and curated and edited by John. So I really appreciate being a part of it. And I'm going to start with, I'm not gonna read all of the poems from here. I'm going to start with, um, Two that I haven't really read out loud. Um, well, I've read once, right below the surface. Mom's fingers somersaulting across the soft, tender meat of my soul's involuntary reflex of laughter, squeezing ribs into a spasm of tears and gasps. She lets me catch my breath, waits for me to relax just long enough to want more. Hairs on the back of my neck shimmy in response. A wave of jelly beans rolls up my legs and into my belly, exploding in jelly bean colors. Manicurists ask if I'm okay. Do not laugh, do not laugh, do not laugh. I squirm in the massage chair to distract myself. My mind somersaults into unshoed, unsocked feet, trekking their way through thorned cotton fields. New moon midnight runs to freedom, mud-colored blood oozing from blisters. Callus remover is $2 extra. Warm spa water gurgles beneath me. She sets the timer to massage my calves. Vibrant cherry red jelly bean colored toes are smiling the first few steps feel like giggles. And then I have one, thank you. Um, in honor of the very first poem I ever memorized um, and the very first poet I loved. And this is in honor of, well, it's called Stevenson's Swing. My favorite poem is not a poem anymore, but a memory of where we met, tilting the edge of language, slicing its way into my jaw ajar, swallowing laughter, sand kicked its inch pinching nerves across my arms, an itch of breeze only relieved by do it again and do it again and one more time, short of breath, like hanging from monkey bars, rubber palms slip, sweat tickle, toe drumming up, exhale up, ground unbound up, winged hair, flying dream. So that's Mr. Stevenson. And this will be the last one I read from Toya. And this is called Trompe l'oeil, um, which is a trick of the eye in French. I've been told we are not a desert, but we drought all year long. Skin cracks at the thought of losing water. We drought long, arid summer days in winter. Wrong place to live if you don't like the sun. Fire has a season all its own, anytime the wind blows. Dehydrated straw lawns 
withered leaves, wilted bushes and trees. We drought even though water is rationed yearly, it is never enough. But we're not waterless, it trickles just below the surface. When it rains, underground water table gurgles up. We flash flood long enough to destroy the mirage of desert. Arroyo is a lizard tail regenerating Escher's mind eye tricks. Cars float on forgotten rivers, water huddles in houses. Three days later, sun resurrects desert rats and water is grit ghost gone. Ooh. That's from Choya Needles, 59. And somebody said, you have to sing. So I'm gonna do um, a tribute. I always write about my mom. So this is from um, Sirens in Her Belly by Jammy Publication Publishing. And this is my mother's voice. My mother's voice is the soothe of lullabies cradled in midnight. And my mother's voice is strong like Carmen McRae. When she speaks of flowers, she just doesn't waft in fragrance. She goes to the root. And my mother's voice is gospel like Aretha before respect. And to the point to the minute TCB, Aretha demanding R-E-S-P-E-C-T. And my mother's voice is Harriet Tubman. Hush, hush, baby. Freedom is calling. No more wailing on the other side. Mahalia sings with my mother's voice and Maya speaks with my mother's voice and Nikki smiles at the sound of truth rippling through another year. Sounds like wisdom. I thought I told you not to, scoldings. Sounds like hope. Go on, baby, you can do it. Sounds like love. Everything is gonna be all right. Sounds just like, sounds just like my mother's voice. That's mama, she'd be happy for that one. I wrote another one in here and she told me, don't write any more poems like that about me. <laughs> it's about her hands. So we'll leave mama alone for now. And I'll read a couple of poems from, see, I got so excited running to get the Bamboo Dark Breast, uh, uh, here we go, Dark Press Collection. Um, this poem I wrote in Stephanie's wonderful workshop that I took um, last year. Uh, wonderful prompts, oh my goodness, just got me all over the place. And this one's called, Gargoyles and Goddesses. Mom's perm potion to magically take my hair from Afro crown to Rapunzel flow was a smoldering disaster. I shed from shoulder length to two tiny perpendicular pigtails on either side of my toothless seven-year-old smiling brown face. To not feel so alone, I cut the hair off all my dolls perfect plastics butchered in a blonde Don King heap of who cares. School laughter christened me ugly. At recess, I sat on the bench with the girl taller than anyone in our class and the girl rounder than anyone in our class. We watched the desired girls giggling, running, whispering, looking our way. Looking at the boys, I decided I wanna play. Girls ran behind me, boys ran around me, as though I was a castle wall, as though my head was a gargoyle perched, ready to devour them with my toothless roaring laugh. I became a safe place where girls with long hair would scamper and squeal as boys ran towards them. I would growl like a gargoyle come to life. Boys ran away in fear of being touched by someone unprettied. I'd raise my arms, curl my fingers as though I had claws. They'd run when I gave my toothless dragon growl. They'd run as though I had a gun. I enlisted the help of my two new friends and we became the protectors, the safe place for all that is good from all that is dangerous. We belonged, we're a necessary force like the gods and goddesses we'd been studying. 
invincible we three, christened ourselves Artemis, Athena, and Hestia, untouchable. And that's um, Miss, Miss the wonderful Stephanie. I wouldn't have written it without you. So um, I think I'm not gonna go too much longer. Um, I'm going to read my little villanelle about San Bernardino, and then I'm going to close with um, at the end of the devil's breath uh, about San Bernardino. Um, we are stubborn tumbleweeds, a royal's withered innocence etched in sun, a burning need. Orange groves long deceased, business howls a ghosted din. We are stubborn, stubborn, blah, stubborn tumbleweeds, rooted in what used to be dreams of safe suburban bliss, etched in sun, a burning need. Despite hope's drought, we will not leave. Hollow malls and blaring wind, we are stubborn tumbleweeds. Thorny eyes scrape lonely streets where homeless hide in shivered pitch, etched in sun a vicious need. Murder floods arroyos creek while school kids sit in restless desks. We are stubborn tumbleweeds, etched in sun a burning need. So that's my hometown. Not what it used to be, but thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry, I gotta get some water here. Um, actually, I'm gonna read one more poem and then I'm gonna come back and um, read the final at the end of the devil's breath. This is a new one I wrote. Um, I have a pandemic poem in, uh, Purgatory has an address, and I almost read that pandemic poem, but I think if I can get to it, I'll read the new pandemic poem. Um, ba, ba, ba. Oh, yeah, I'm going to close with Empty Nest. That's more singing, since that's what earlier in a workshop, somebody said, oh, you have to sing. Um, oh, hmm. that's the other workshop poem. Uh, we won't be reading that one. And that's the one I'm going to sing to. So here it is. And this one is from my son and I taking walks while we're sheltering in place. And it's called Deciduous. Green gold leaves shimmy in a lazy blue sky, indifferent Branches giggle and gyrate in breezy autumn surrender. My son calls them laughing trees where time counts backwards. We bare limbed this year, fall faster in a furious rain, burying themselves and us, too many to count, so many to mourn. When I turn on the news, 100,000, 250,000, 500,000, a million plus casket the earth, muzzled hostages of tomorrow, waiting for permission to talk, waiting for permission to grieve, waiting for permission to grieve, waiting for permission to talk, hostages of tomorrow, muzzled casket the earth, a million plus 100,000, 250,000, 500,000, when I turn on the news, so many to mourn, too many to count, burying themselves and us, a furious rain, they fall faster this year, bare limbed, where time counts backwards. My son calls them laughing trees, surrender in breezy autumn, branches giggle and gyrate, indifferent in a lazy blue sky, green gold leaves shimmy. So that's my mirror poem. And now we'll go to nature one last time with At the End of the Devil's Breath. July, wilted cereal in a bowl, we drown in brown milk. The haze of sparklers and fireworks add to the deafening heat 
that drips into August. Caged in by smog, air smells of cigarettes and black exhaust. Surely this place is meant to ignite. September, when he arrives, he thinks this is a flat plain where desert dirt covers everything like snow and sweat is meant for breathing. But then October and the devil's breath laps up lotion, claws skin with its vicious teeth, yowling roofs beat whoosh and bend of threatened windows. Tree leaves sound like ocean, stripped dry, littered bare limbs, the hard ones snap right for a switch. Used to be gangs of tumbleweeds round the streets, now solitary wadded balls of rootless limbs roll by. November is a postcard miracle, surrounded snow-capped crisp sky, where our eyes hang glide like eagles. We perch low in the valley shadow, straining to see the walk of fame, sunset in Hollywood, Palm Springs, peer into the pier of the Pacific. Every mountain peak is paramount. He says, if it weren't for the devil's breath, I'd never know where we are and just how beautiful. So, and I have one small one left for the singing. Thank you. Um, and this is my favorite, one of my favorites. Um, and this was written actually in a Nakia Cheney workshop from a prompt. These feathers weren't meant to be eternal. I shed daily, eggs hatched, gurgling breakfast into baby beaks, nudge to the edge and out, flutter and drift into silhouetted horizon. Bare tree limb chatter sings me back, brown feathers lift memories. I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. So that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, now comes the part where we can ask questions or make comments or whatever you like. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments for uh, Stephanie or Romain? I, I do. Yeah. First of all, I've never heard you sing before, Romain, and that was really, you have a beautiful singing voice. And that's something you should do more of. Um, that's my comment. Uh, and then Stephanie, I just had a question about the last piece you wrote. I was a little bit uh, distracted. So what was the inspiration for creating that character again? Well, thanks for asking that, Tim. Yeah, the inspiration is, you know, is, is hanging out with John Brantingham, who is working on a, a, a selection of flash fiction pieces about this character who is whose name is Finnegan. And I, there's some kind of dialogue with Finnegan's Wake going on. I haven't read Finnegan's Wake, so I, I guess that. Um, and Finnegan teaches community college and he sees <laughs> this completely weird, um, in, he's very competent at being incompetent. He's got a very problematic <laughs> mother who keeps on showing up in class. She's actually, a, I, I adore her. Um, he's got, he, his flip-flops keep on coming off. He's just kind of a mess, but he's, he's really, really funny. And I loved how John took, you know, again, biographical data and, but, and kind of went pushed it way, 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 way to this very extreme place. And I like that idea. And, and just kind of thinking about that, I thought, you know, what about, and Scarsdale is the name of a fancy suburb outside of New York City. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, Scarsdale, yeah, she's, yeah, her, yeah. And she, and she went to this insane private school and she, you know, she has all these PhDs. And I just kind of went, oh yeah, right. And she moves up here because she, you know, she lives in the world of ideas and doesn't know what the country is like. So she thinks, <laughs> like, you know, Thoreau and Goethe. And I think some of you know, I am not a Goethe fan. So it's always great when I can use Goethe in a satirical situation. And so I'm just kind of, I wrote something more um, uh, about, about the town, the village of Cutting, thanks to Linda's um, 
um, how to write about sex um, class, I ended up going kind of more. So I'm just kind of at the beginning of this project, but but it's really really fun to 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 write her. And again, I'm not entirely sure who she is yet. She seems to have these encounters with monsters, which again happened while I was writing it. You know, I got to the dry cleaner and went, oh yeah, well she's had these other experiences, and I thought, well, I guess she she has. Interesting. I didn't I, know. I love that. I, I just want to say, I love how you just casually threw that in there. And I love the, for, your writing is always really funny. I, 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 not always, but I mean, I love your sense of humor in your writing, but I, uh, I love the, uh, she encountered an ogre, long story. She encountered, I can't remember what it was, shorter story. It's just really good. I love the casual nature of, of that what would otherwise be just a very strange reference, but it, the way that you casually throw it in there, it's like, well, okay, fine. Yeah, that works. Yay, I'm so glad that part worked for you. I thought yeah. about cutting it and I thought, no, they're staying in. You know, this, again, this, is the, this is the rough draft, they're staying in and they yeah. may stay in. So thank you so much. I'm really glad. I'm gonna shut up now and let other people talk. I would like to ask both of you, and thank you both so much for uh, reading tonight. Um, I'm always curious when someone has a collection or is included in an anthology, how you go about choosing your works and if it's a, you know, your own collection, how you if they're related or you know how you group them and then also how how it came about that you got published how you got you know your your books together i don't know that's pretty big pretty big question but those are two those are two great questions and you know i actually had that question i had the, the the collection question for remain for you and and for um um the purgatory book is yeah how did you this is just so it's so beautifully organized. And I was wondering how you figured out how to, you figured all that out. You're so kind. Um, I was, oh, I don't know how long to tell this story. I'll try to be as quickly as possible. My mother passed in 2016. So I started writing personal, I started trying to, I'm from a closed adoption. And all of the sudden, um, I had no more family besides my sons. And so I started writing about being an adopted child and trying to piece stuff together. And that happened in 2016, I started this. Um, and then I started writing about San Bernardino because I realized that was part of my family too. I didn't know how much place um, makes identity. And so I had been writing these pieces for the last four four or five years. And then when the opportunity came and, um, you know, for a manuscript to be put together, I wanted to make a narrative. And I wanted to start with um, trying to figure out my roots, who I am. And I took all of the myths that have been told to me about who I am. And so that was the first section. But I also came to know myself as a black person in San Bernardino. So the middle section deals with some of that awakening. And then the closing is me in place and me coming to identity in place. So it's a, a brief little memoir in three parts. And um, I got to know my mom really well from putting this together and I'm working, I'm still working on this. I have, a, I'm working with Jennifer Tilton, a professor at Redlands and we're interviewing um, the elders of San Bernardino, the black elders of San Bernardino because there are no books about the place I grew up in. When you read about San Bernardino, it's someone else's story. There's no West Side San Bernardino. So I'm still working on that um, and writing poems about that. So that's how I came up with um, putting together Perkins. And of course my son, um, when it came for a cover, um, he read the poem and he says, oh, this is Nana's house. Oh, I could do this really quickly. And he ran upstairs and he sketched it and, and came back down. So this was my son's uh, drawing of purgatory. 
Thank you for asking that. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Um, um, that's really because that that makes so much sense your description Romaine, because the or, the organization of the book does feel so organic and so and and so unforced and it's so cool that it's part of this ongoing journey that is really got a, re, a research component and then it's got this imp, such this crucial aspect of of telling telling about a, a place that's only been told about from a certain number of points of view. And then there's this whole other set of points of view that are missing. So it's it's such an it's so important. Well, um, as far Marianne, just to, um the one of the things that's great about writing, you know, something that a novelette is there's no organization. It's one, it's one thing. Um, and I was sort of smiling to myself as Romaine was talking it, so beautifully and talking about this whole journey and thinking, mm, this is why I made the move from short stories to novels, because a novel is a thing. <laughs> and because I think, I, I think this may be partly because I have undiagnosed ADHD or some kind of <laughs> undiagnosed learning difference. I find organizing things in a collection actually really hard. Oh, it froze again. She'll come back who made some suggestions. And then I laid everything out on the floor and, and kind of walked along and looked at it and went, no, I don't like it. I don't like this poem here. I need to move it. Um, and so, I mean, that's the only way I can do it. Um, and then you had another question and I don't remember what it was. Um, it was about the organization within a collection, but then also how you came about getting published. What was that process like? Um, I'll just share very quickly that I got published for the first time. Thanks to this, thanks oh. to poets and writers. Yeah, there was a call for um, there was a call for stories um, about 9-11 and I submitted one. And I got published and actually I had total beginner's luck. I got published in, in the Bellevue Literary Review, which is a really Ooh, good place. Wow. But I, I, I'm, I, I look through poets and writers again, I'm so old school with, you know, with my paper magazine. Um, <laughs> I go through it every time it comes and say, say is, there, is there something for mm -hmm. me to, you know, that I could submit to? How about you, Romaine? Um, I have had this hiccuping writing journey. And so I was first published when I was 14 in a little local newspaper. And then the first time I got paid for a poem, I was 17 um, in Vegetarian Times. I'm not gonna tell anybody what is this is such a little corny poem, but I wrote and wrote and got published. I went on the um, radio when I was a teenager reading poetry. <laughs> and then um, I stopped when I got married. And yeah, then there was this uh, long, so it's been kind of life interrupted and coming back and forth. And um, when some of it has been, I hear an anthology and I'm like, oh, I have a mindset for this. I can write something for it. And then sometimes I'm in women who submit and women who submit is so wonderful. Actually, Laura's here from Women Who Submit. Yay, we support each other. And so um, we encourage each other to look for places to submit our work. That's where the it comes from. And we have a monthly uh, submission blitz where we get together and we're supposed to send things out and we share resources with each other. So, yeah. I hope that answer did that answer. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Robin, did you? Your journey sounds so much like mine. I was just really amazed. Oh, okay. I mean that. I was young like you and did things like that. And then when I got married, same thing. And 
so here I am now, the kids gone, trying to get back into what I used to be, I guess. You know, for me, I never stopped. I think this morning, Linda talked about that, that she didn't take herself um, seriously. It was a hobby. And then it just kind of went to the side. And um, I, I still wrote when I was married. I just didn't send off anywhere or do anything with it. And to be honest, um, I never read any African-American poetry in school. Everything I read by a, a Black author, I read on my own. And so I never really thought that it could be something that I could do for a career. To be honest, I always thought it would be something on the side. And I wish that I had, if I had had a mentor or somebody, I would have probably continued, but I didn't. But it's okay because we're doing it now. And um, at the end of my first marriage, that's about the time when slams came out and, um, you know, all the spoken word was out there. So it was a good time for me to, to blossom again. And so it's been this journey. Um, and that's why we're writers though, Robin, is because we're on this journey. And so it's, it's a beautiful experience. Um, we're, we're all just, you know, shedding our wings and getting rid of some feathers and we get to grow new feathers. So, yeah. Yes. Pretty fancy feathers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you know, from, from where I sit, I'm listening to these stories and thinking, well, how amazing that that you started so young, Romaine. That's amazing. And and amazing, Robin, that you were doing making creative work young. And, and again, Linda talking about that. Um, yeah. Other folks like myself had a very di different dream. I really didn't. I didn't show my creative work to people. I was interested in acting uh, for a long time. Um, and then that just that just felt like a, a very scary, difficult career. So mm -hmm. I I decided that I not to pursue that. Um, but I didn't I made creative writing, but I didn't share it. I didn't share it until I was, gosh, in my mid 40s. Mm -hmm. um, so some of us don't have the courage to start young. So I, I'm I, I bow to you all for starting. Oh. Yeah, you stopped, but you started. So you had something to go back to. I think the some of us who start much later are like, well, this is it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't have a prime to look back to because I didn't, I, I didn't feel, I didn't feel I could, I could share work. So I guess I'm just in, in great admiration of, of you all starting young and then having the courage to say, I'm, I'm, I'm going back to this. This matters I, to me because that takes a lot of courage. I have a question now. You wrote, but you didn't share. So how long were you writing before you decided that you were going to pursue it? That's a, that's such a lovely question. Um, and um, I, um, as I said, I wrote poetry for years and years and years and years. And um, actually the, the person who got me started on, in, in sending my work out was a student was a student in World Lit 17A, Mark Bedell, thank you so much, Mark, who was um, the editor of the undergraduate uh, creative writing magazine at UCR. And he was a wonderful student. Mm -hmm. And he and I were talking after class. I don't remember you know, what the author had been. And I said, oh gosh, that's great that you're doing that. And you know how wonderful there's a creative writing magazine. And he, I think said something to me. He said, oh, do you write? And I think I maybe said, yeah, I do. And he said, you should send us something. And I did. And um, oh. it was, a, it was um, a poem about my, about my dad's death. Mm -hmm. and, and it was accepted for publication. So that was, that was the beginning. So thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, that, that kind of hooks me into something that, I, that I, I wanted to just add very quickly, which is back to Mary Ann's question, how do you get published? Well, it's, I think in many ways, it's about submitting your workplaces, but it's also about relationships. And one of the things that's been so great about Culturama 
is that we have the opportunity to meet publishers and meet editors and we're going to have opportunities to do that later on this month and um that's just been such a huge gift it's just been yes. it's been huge it's just been so important um because it gets us out of thinking about about pub you know sort of publishing and and sort of publishers and authors and this completely transactional thing yes Should be back. Yeah. <laughs> been, I feel like I've been so fortunate, really particularly through through um, Culturama and through John and Anne um, to, to meet people who I admire so much and who have published my work. So I hope you'll, I think you'll really enjoy meeting some of those people later on this month. And uh, please use me as a resource as much as you need. Come and talk to me, happy to work with y'all. Thank you. Oh, what other questions do we have? Oh, yeah, Cindy, you, you had a question earlier. Yeah, um, well, first, um, Romaine, I love your voice so much. I hope someday you do Audible or something because I could just fall asleep to that. It's just so, so beautiful. And um, Stephanie, you know, gosh, I love you so much because you have been one of my yeah teachers, my mentor, my inspiration behind crazy stories. Um, and I just wanted to thank you both for your readings. Mm -hmm. um, my question is um, how I'm like, first of all, I started writing late in life too, like <laughs> after I retired. And I just decided to do a, a freaking children's book out of the blue. And I crack up over it because it's all messed up. I mean, it, I don't even know how it got published. I published it to create space, but I mean, it was sold at the Mission Inn and I don't even, you know, it wasn't really done well at all. I'm not looking at it. I didn't know what I was doing. I was a receptionist at Kaiser. <laughs> so anyways, um, I crack up over it because it made a newspaper article. I met in Landia. I met, I started to get into indie. Uh, I was a panelist on the indie thing. And I was like, I didn't know what I was doing. I had just totally faked it, faked it. And I think so most, most of us do that. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, but, but I decided that's not my thing. And so now I, I'm, I'm writing all across the board though. So how, when I was little, I think I was starved for, for using my imagination. I was all in survival mode. I came from a very traumatic childhood into um, having, you know, children very young and then surviving and getting a, you know, I got a job that's, you know, paid the bills. You know, I worked at Kaiser almost 30 years and, you know, bought a house and it, it paid the bills, but I was always in survival mode. So when I retired, it's like a big old whoosh of imagination and, and uh, wonder came out. And now I'm like, where did all this come from? So I have like a screenplay, I have this, I have that. I mean, I know everybody sees me on Facebook, I'm all over the place. How do you stick to one thing and just finish it and submit it and, you know, or is, is this just something that's my problem? <laughs> Thank you. Um. <clears throat> That sounds like a Stephanie question because you. Did. <laughs> you I was did. just thinking that sounds like a Romaine question. Yes. <laughs> okay, so um, the, there's no one thing that you have to stay with. You maybe because you're retired. The delightful thing is you can set your own calendar and your own schedule, and you can use a, a variety of resources and send out short stories and essays and plays and go to these workshops. And so you don't have to have just one medium to write yeah. in. So, you know, just give yourself permission and have your, you know, have it sectioned out and, and enjoy, you know, the fact that you're flooded with creativity. Uh -huh. Yeah. It's, um, there's no limits. You don't have organization. to. Limit. Organization is what I'm hearing is like time it out or, yeah, I think that's what I'll do. Yeah. yeah. Fun. I enjoy being with all of you people. Yeah, what Romaine says. <laughs> Great, <laughs> thank you. Ditto. Um, 
I've also, noticed, I've also noticed, I think women do this a lot. It's like, I have to be more organized. Yes. <laughs> you know, yeah. Picasso did not say this. <laughs> so, you know? and Picasso didn't worry about the laundry. Right, right. But, you know, I have to, I have to streamline, I have to, you know, they, I don't think, I don't think they yeah. did that. So, so, so I, I agree. Right. <laughs> yeah. May I add one more thing to that? Um, I think sometimes our minds get in our, in our way and we think, well, I've got to do this. And if you just listen to your body and let yourself write what you want to write, it's going to be pulling from you what you need to be pulled from. Yeah. What are the questions or comments do we have? I have a question for Romaine. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and Romaine, I just I've been thinking about this ever since ever since the renaming the colors class. I had not, I think you'd said before, but I had not remembered that you were an Arthur Rambo fan. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, because <laughs> not everyone loves Rambo. I mean, he's a real, we love him, we hate him, we, you know, I we dig him. him, we have no idea what he's. So I want to hear about, about Rambo and you and <laughs> that relationship. Um, well, I have a degree in French. And so um, going through undergrad, you know, you have to read a lot of literature and in French. And on the person, I, I fell in love with him first on the personal level, him and Verlaine and that whole, <laughs> that whole thing. But then also he was so young when he created, um, when he wrote and just mesmerized the men and women around him with his craft and then his craft and, and, um, um, Fleur du Mal, it's just, it's mesmerizing. It just pulls me in and I have to sit and just read. And when I read them, I, I just read and read and read, you know, reread them because um, the rhythm, the images are just, I just, I just love them. <laughs> so that's how I met, that's, I was going to say, that's how I met him. <laughs> but, um, you know, he fascinated me and I read about his life and I read about Verlaine and I read about the personal and then I read their poetry. So it was the personal first and then their poetry. And yeah, yeah. That's I so know. cool. I, I, I love that. I, lo I love him too, but I did not love him right away because uh, because <laughs> the, the French is the French. Is, he's hard, hard to read, understand in French. I was like, why am I looking up all these wacky vocabulary <laughs> words? And then there were just more. And then I, I got older and was like, OK, I'll read him in translation. OK, he's a he's amazing. <laughs> and, oh. So thank you for satisfying my curiosity about that. <laughs> thank you. Let's see. Dennis, you unmuted. Yeah, um, I love things in concert. And I love that uh, uh, Stephanie comes from this world of this imaginary world that she makes up that isn't really made up, that is drawing on real life. That Romaine uh, with Purgatory, too, how that short little book is your life story in 55 pages. Short yeah. story just synced and boiled down. And we can go back to Stephanie's writing and revisit this area that she keeps going to. And now there's another area in, in Sparsdale, her adventures there. But uh, it was really a treat to hear both of you and how much you cross paths uh, artistically uh, and come from different places in that respect. The uh, realistic and the imaginary, mm -hmm. there's not a huge division. And I think both of you are a beautiful example of, of that live coexisting. Thank you for, for doing this tonight, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dennis. Really, really appreciate you and and yes. and everybody. Just you know, the, Dennis did the did the cover of, of of Rescue Plan. Just to, and his and the cover of his book is amazing. You're just yes. I, I you amaze me in your ability to work in all these different forms because I'm I'm strictly a words person and I'm going to do you all a big favor and I'm not going to sing for you. So <laughs> I'm going to not do that. And you're welcome. Um, but, Dennis does so much. You talked about multi, um, having all of these different ways to express yourself um, and then keeping them straight and keeping them not just straight, but 
um, there's a perfection to it too in what you do in streamlining and, and in presenting and, and you do everything. So it can be done. It can be done, Cindy. Um, <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Back to, back to Cindy, Cindy's concern of all these, all these things. Um, sometimes I think it's actually nice to have a lot of things going on because yeah. it makes some, for me at least, just kind of obsessing about one thing is dangerous because I don't, I, I, I get too, I, I can't see it anymore. If I'm too in it, I can't back up from it and kind of sort of cross training, doing these different things. I can come back, if I, you know, do a poem or I do a short story, I can go back to the novel project and go, oh, well, it's this. Whereas if I sat with it too long, it, it wouldn't get better. Or that's, that's at least how my process goes. And I agree. That's what I loved about purgatory because I was starting to put together this memoir and it was getting, I was getting stuck in some of the same themes over and over. And so it made me put the brakes on and, and start to distill. So yeah, I can see that. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, do we have any other questions, comments? Robin might have one. I have a question for Stephanie. Um, what is your next project? Thanks for asking, and and I I need I'm going to ask you that right back. But um, I actually have got I've got a lot going on. Um, I've I've got a novel coming out in April, and I think that I've got a novella coming out next fall, and I'm I'm really 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 excited about that. So I have those two things going on, and I'm making sort of final revisions to the novel. And I'm also making some revisions to the novella because um, when I when I'm creating characters, I tend to take as as kind of the people that I know and the people that are out there. Mm -hmm. And once I do that, I try to kind of change things up so that um, the characters yes. don't look exactly like my husband, for example, <laughs> yes. or yeah. or my best friend, <laughs> because it's like you because it is fiction, it's not memoir. So I'm sort of in the process of making those changes. And then actually speaking of memoir, my husband and I are gearing up to, to write a joint memoir about our pathologically lying grandfathers. <laughs> That <laughs> people were enormous liars. Um, mine actually more so, not surprisingly, it's like magical realism. I found out about this and was like, okay, well, yeah, I come from a family of incredible liars. So it makes a kind of sense, but we're gearing up to work on that. And I'm excited about it. We've got research to do. We've got, oh, wow. we've got to figure out how to do the or the structure of it. But it's cool, and and these grandfathers are really problematic and interesting. So it, it's going to be fun to. And and is the title going to be Incredible Liars? <laughs> I'm thinking it's. It, I'm thinking about. We're thinking about calling it our incre You know, our pathologically lying grandfathers, or our hugely <laughs> lying grandfathers, something like that. But it may. You know, it's early days. We need to write a draft. But um, but I'm excited about that, and then I'm excited about uh, about Scarsdale and and her adventures. Okay, Romaine, what about you? What's next? Well, in the immediate, um, Juanita and I and um, uh, two other Bamboo Dark Press uh, writers who, Kendall and, uh, we're going to go to AWP. <laughs> we're, we're not going to go to AWP. They also have virtual. So we're going to be a virtual panel um, as Bamboo Dark Press um, being published under Bamboo Dart Press memoirs, the mini memoir. So that's the most um, recent thing. And then I'm working on the poems for um, from the research that we're doing. And that's going to culminate, um, I think in 2022, um, they are working on an oral history map. And so I'm going to be writing poems and have some of those included in that. And I'm also going to be working on 
editing an anthology for um, Black Lives Matters for Blacklandia. Um, and I'll start on that sometime um, next year. And hopefully I'll be retiring. If I can just focus myself, I'll be retiring in May, which will free up a lot of time so that I can take some classes and do, um, cause I wanna do some screen. I do make up stories for my students as I'm giving them assignments. And sometimes they'll go, what movie is that? <laughs> and I, say, I just made that up for you. They're like, oh, you should make that into. So I wanna play with that and see, see what happens with that. So, yeah. Wait, wait. So what I'm hearing is you guys are doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I like that. <laughs> I'm hearing screenplays and panels. and <laughs> That's um, awesome. That way, if you get blocked with some project, you have something else to go yeah. right to. True, so true. You shuffle them around. <laughs> Yeah. Exactly, Robin. Yeah. And that was actually a real issue for me doing this novella, which is the sequel to my novel, The Puppet Turners. I really had a tough time making progress with it. I wrote one draft, which didn't work. I wrote another draft, which also didn't work. And I just kind of, went... and that was when I went, hmm, remember that novel that I wrote, that I talked about as a joke and that I then wrote for NaNoWriMo. Remember that? Is it really as bad as I remember? And of course, part of it was, but some of it was became this new book. And I worked on that. And after I finished that, then I could go back to the other one. It was very strange how that worked. I was like, okay, well, let me try this again. And then with the help of Neil Aitken, who's an amazing uh, poet and book doctor, um, I was able to figure out what to do with it. And distance is often helpful. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I sound like I know what I'm talking about. Of course you do. Uh, <laughs> so I wanted to just say thank you to both Stephanie and Romaine for coming and doing this. It was all so wonderful. And both of you are very inspiring to me. And I wish we could be in person and we could be out somewhere, all of us at a big table talking yeah. about all of these things. Yes. You know, like a salon. Yeah. Someday. Yeah. Someday soon. And you're inspiring to us. So yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And Steve, thank you for coming um, and spending time again uh, with us. Yeah, it's good to see you always. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie and Romaine. We we really appreciate this. What a what a wonderful reading and what a wonderful conversation. So it's all. Thank you. Yay. Thank you. Our total thank pleasure. You. Okay. And thank you, John and Anne, for doing all this organizing. Laura, thank you yes. for coming. <laughs> so so um, we've got uh, many more weeks of, uh, of this and it's going to be fantastic. As they said, we're going to be talking about publishing, we're going to talk about writing. And, you know, anytime you want to talk to us individually, there's, there's several of us who are just waiting for to hear your questions. Don't be, don't be shy or nervous at all. So please. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.